thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we're really excited to have everybody here and have a really interesting discussion. Um, we're going to save some time at the end for Q&A. So if you'd like to throw your questions in that chat box towards the end, we'll have an open forum discussion. Um, so introducing Brad Hamilton, our wonderful moderator. Uh, Brad is an award-winning investigative reporter and editor with more than 30 years of media experience. He runs a journalism nonprofit, The Hatch Institute, which publishes long-form enterprise stories in partnership with The New York Times, ABC News, The Guardian, and other outlets and mentors, uh, emerging reporters. He is a longtime university lecturer and guest speaker at journalism schools like Columbia, NYU, and and other CUNY uh, uh, colleges and membership organizations. In 2002, he created and led the New York Post first investigations unit. So Brad, thank you so much for coming. Take it away. <laughs> thank you so much, Leanna, and welcome everyone uh, to this wonderful event uh, that has been uh, put together with uh, by the Florence Belsky, Fa Florence Belsky Foundation. Um, a great organization and um, a, a very timely topic for all of us. Um, we have a fantastic uh, panel here to help us address uh, the fundamental questions of what's going to happen with the upcoming midterms. And, uh, and what we're going to do tonight is we're going to help everyone rock the midterms. So um, that's the goal here. And um, I think um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to inter introduce the panelists. Uh, we have a fantastic group here. We have uh, we have Donna Norton from uh, Moms Rising, which is a, uh, a a terrific organization, one million strong. Um, they advocate for advocate for uh, on a variety of issues on behalf of, of women, moms, and families. Uh, we also have Nick Morrow from Vote.org. Uh, uh, recognize the nationally recognized um, organization that uses technology to help um, increase voter participation. Uh, and we also have Tom Bergen from Headcount, um, and that's another great organization that uses music um, to increase voter registration uh, and to pr promote uh, um, participation in democracy. So the midterms, here they are, they're facing us. What is it, 26 days? Uh, 27 days uh, before the midterms on November 8th, and I think everybody can pretty much um, be in agreement that they are hugely, hugely consequential uh, to us as a nation as far as protecting American democracy um, and confirming our faith in the U.S. political system. We know there are a lot of um, warning signs uh, that are facing us, and many of us believe that right now we're we're face we're we're essentially coming into a test of the of the character of our nation. That's what's at stake. Um, specifically, we know that the polls are saying that the upcoming U.S. Senate race is kind of a dead heat, something like a 50-50 chance that the Democrats will uh, control uh, the Senate. Um, and this is uh, despite some of those warning signs that I mentioned earlier, specifically uh, Republican candidates who are rejecting the leg legitimacy of the 2020 election, people who are expressing support for the assault on the Capitol, and a number of ca uh, candidates who have some troubling personal issues in their past. I'm looking at you, Herschel Walker. So this all amid a variety of disturbing developments, Roe versus Wade being overturned, um, the uh, the Trump County trial for January 6 rioters, et cetera. There's all kinds of stuff. There's threats of violence from members of the far right. Uh, there's an epic level of, 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 of distrust in the Supreme Court. Um, and of course, there's fear that future elections will be contested on questionable grounds. All of us, all of that leads us to the importance of full and complete participation in these upcoming midterms. Um, now, the people who are participating here, we're assuming that you know a lot of this already and that you're ready to vote on November 8th. Um, so what we've done here is we've tried to put together a group of people who can give suggestions, uh, specific suggestions on what you might be able to do to encourage others to be similarly oriented, uh, to help out with registration, to door knock and canvas. Um, to donate and to do other things to support candidates that you want uh, to see elected. 
um, and of course, to protect the rights of voters when they come to the polls next month. So with that having been said, um, we're gonna get right into some suggestions here. Um, and, the, and, and yes, we'll have time for questions at the end, but I'm keen to, to tap into the expertise of the panelists we have. And so I'm gonna start with a very simple question. And I guess um, maybe, I'll, uh, maybe I'll ask this of Nick. Maybe Nick can start us off. Um, maybe you can give us uh, perhaps the, the one most sing single, most effective step that an individual can take, something that someone can do to help increase voter participation um, in these upcoming midterms. Sure, the single one, the, the silver bullet, I will try and uh, come up with one. I think that, and thank you so much, Brad, for, for moderating us today, and thank you all for joining. Um, you know, I'm the communications director at vote.org. Uh, we are a technology platform that allows people to register to vote, verify their registration, request a ballot, find their polling location. Um, in 2020, we had nearly 40, 40 million people use our tools. Um, so where we kind of come to this work is from a place of data and being sort of able to understand what's motivating people to go to the polls. So there's a lot of motivating factors this year. You know, the overturning of Roe v. Wade is obviously a huge one. Um, we've seen some sweeping action from the Biden administration around student loans. The January 6 hearings have been happening all year, and there are just little spikes that we've been able to see that sort of correspond with these news events that show what's driving people to the polls. Um, I think I, I may say two things um, that, that are probably the most effective thing. Um, one of them is that Voting is really something that has become very politicized, um, just simply the act of voting, right? Um, and a lot of specific elected officials um, are trying to make voting itself seem partisan, to restrict the ability of people to be able to vote early, vote at extended hours, have voting by mail. Um, there are so many different uh, ways that people are trying to restrict that ability to vote. So one of the specific things that we are trying to do is to disentangle that partisanship from the mere act of voting, because voting itself is not political. What you do with your vote is. Um, so one of the things that we are really trying to make people aware of, and uh, I think that it is just helpful to say in your daily conversations with people, the act of voting is, is a right. It's not a political issue. It's not a partisan issue. And being able to talk about that with authority is one really, really important thing we can do to disentangle some of this, uh, some of the threats to actual voting rights that are happening in state legislatures around the country. Um, another one. No, so is, you're saying, so just to interrupt yeah. here, you're saying specifically what you're, what you're doing is you're encouraging people to recognize this is their right and they should be exercising that right. So in other words, it's essentially saying you have the power. It's right. reminding them that they have the power essentially. Is that, is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And you know, I'm glad you said power because I think that another part of this is we see so many disaffected voters over the years, right? Where they elect a president and they think we're done. They should be able to do everything now that I want them to do. Um, but that's not how the political process works, right? It only works if you are continually engaged year over year, not just in presidential years, um, every time you are able to exercise your right to vote. Um, and when people understand that and think about voting as a muscle, right, that you have to keep engaging with, that's powerful too, because there are so many people who want to restrict the right to vote. That in and of itself should let us know how powerful one vote really is. Um, and I think one of the one of the key things that we are trying to say to voters this year is that so many consequential things happen below the presidential level. You're electing your mayors, you are electing your city council, you're electing school boards, you are electing in some places judges, the people who actually administer elections. And the most consequential decisions that are happening on a political level often happen at the state and local level. So being engaged in those races is super duper important. And because the margins are smaller, your vote actually does have more of an impact in some of those races, right? So- Yeah, I mean, particularly when you look at the results, you know, sometimes the number of people who will vote for, you know, a given judge or a school board uh, representative, you know, it's, it can be in the hundreds, right? Yeah. So you're right about the, you know, 
you know, when people, I think one of the things that people do feel discouraged about is what, what, what does my vote do? I mean, I hear that a lot from people like, why are you voting? Well, one vote, what does it matter? Well, in a case of like, you know, who controls the school board or who controls, you know, the state, the state group that's going to, you know, certify these elections, it can be, you know, it can be in the thousands or even sometimes in the hundreds, right? Absolutely, right? And the, the smaller you get down to, I mean, there are people who just don't even vote in those elections, right? Like they might just tick their congressperson and kind of like turn that ballot in. So I think that there is, um, I guess those things go together a little bit, right? It's being able to understand the power that you as a voter have and try and take it back from those who would seek to restrict the right to vote. So um, I think that those are really important things. Um, they, they happen on the day-to-day person-to-person level when you're talking about voting. Um, when you're talking to your neighbor outside, you know, you get to elect the mayor that is setting the regulations for the day that trash is getting picked up. You know, there are so many actual consequential elections that happen that affect every part of your daily lives. So um, I think that those conversations and being able to talk about voting as a civic duty and not a partisan enterprise, I think those are the the main things that we're trying to get across. Fantastic. That's that's great. And I think that, that you've given some very clear guidance as far as you know talking points, if you will, or areas of focus that people can um, seize on when they're having these discussions. Talking about you know impactful moments and things that can either encourage or depress uh, voter participation, it's hard for me to think of one that has more impact than the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe versus Wade, right? Because one, it, it, it's just, it's kind of like something that some people predicted might happen, but it's just been a devastating uh, development for so many people, um, uh, not, not just women, but, but anyone who cares about a woman, frankly. Uh, and I think that that, that, is, that sort of cuts both ways. I feel like a lot of women are, are motivated because of Roe Wade, but there can also be people who are just discouraged because they feel like, what, you know, what can I do really? The Supreme Court is just going to overturn everything and uh, screw it. I'm not going to get involved. So with that, I'm going to turn to you, Donna. I mean, this is your area of expertise. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What, what kinds of, of impacts are you, are you anticipating for this election, um, specifically vis-a-vis -vis Roe Wade? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, I'm um, executive vice president of an organization called Moms Rising. So this is a huge issue for moms, of course. Uh, six out of 10 women who need and get abortions are already moms. So this is a huge issue for moms being able to control when and how large their families are. And um, yeah, it was, you know, a gut punch to women across this country and particularly mothers, um, both who worry about their own power to control their size and when they have their families, but also about their children and what the future of their, their children is going to be, um, and particularly their daughters. And so we've seen like a huge surge in uh mobilization, people both registering to vote, uh, wanting to help get out the vote. Um, and, you know, as uh, Nick said, there is, you know, we have to overcome, um, you know, a level of cynicism in society about the impact voting has. But I think, you know, women are really Prime to show that we have power. We already like are at the ends of our, our wits after you know two years of COVID and taking care of kids at home without a care infrastructure, without affordable child care, without affordable elder care. A lot of frustration about those promises of Biden and the Congress not coming to um, fruition in the last bill that was passed uh, by Congress. So I think there's a lot of anger and energy. And it's like a, a process of transforming that energy and channeling that into um, getting people to the polls, which is what we are all doing and what we need everyone's help in doing. Um, one of the challenges that mom voters particularly have is most moms are working and then also taking care of kids when they get home from work. and you know, voting day is on a Tuesday. That's really like not structurally doable for most working people in this country, but particularly moms. And so one of the messages that we um, really push is um, 
be a voter, raise a voter. I mean, by being a voter, you'll you'll raise voters. It's great to take kids with you to the polls if you're voting at the polls or to sit them down at the kitchen table if you're voting early or with absentee ballots. We have um, fun activities on our website at, at momsvote.org that you can do with your kids. And so we're trying to um, sort of overcome the cynicism both by showing moms what can be achieved through their advocacy all throughout the year, but also just to say, you know, it's not just for us and our future, it's for our kids, it's to raise them to be the kinds of citizens we want them to be in the future. And, you know, they can really be part of that process. So I have a question. Do you have um, specific um, programs to help support women who are struggling with the with the physical um, um, challenge of actually getting to the polling place to cast their vote? I mean, are, how are you how are you addressing that? Are, are there things that you're doing to help uh, like carpooling or babysitting services or things like that that will help women um, who are having a hard time just getting away to get to get to the poll? We encourage our members to, to reach out to moms in their communities, to their friends and their family members to really work with their um, friends and family members and communities to make sure everybody has a plan to vote, whether that's, you know, how are you getting to the polls? Can I help you watch your kids while you're going to the polls? Um, you know, here's, you know, resources that can take you to the polls. Um, so we really work with our members to to make sure that their networks have the information they need ahead of time to make that plan, um, because the day of people, you know, with kids and working, it's just it's a lot to figure out how you're going to make voting happen. Exactly. Uh, and speaking of challenges, um, I, I wanted to to, to uh, address this next one to Tom, because uh, headcount um because of your emphasis on using music uh, to help voter registration, my assumption is that you guys are in touch with a lot of younger people, some of the younger generation people who are coming, so some of them may be voting for the first time. Um, and I think it's, it's, that's, uh, that's an amazing thing. That's awesome. Um, they also, it's, it feels like those younger people are often, often very attuned uh, to the needs of others. There's a great deal of inclusivity there in that generation. Um, and so I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering, first of all, what are you guys doing to help the, those younger people get excited about the midterms? And also, have you, have you um, come up with some ways to help um, young people participate so that those who have challenges like visual or physical impairments or have low literacy or those who need assistance, are, those, is, are you finding that the younger people um, that you're that you're dealing with are those people finding ways to get that part of them uh, their orientation excited about helping out with this election? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll probably kind of answer in in two parts, um, just because there's a lot to unpack there, right? And so, yeah, young people, you know, the the common narrative is that young people don't participate in voting and that they're not interested in voting, and that's simply not true. You know, time and time again, studies have shown us that that is just a false narrative. Um, the biggest thing is that young people, it's difficult for young people to register to vote. Once young people are registered to vote, they turn out in numbers that are comparable to any other group of voters that are registered. And so it's really that that big barrier is getting young people to register. And so that's kind of where headcount exists, is thinking about, okay, how can we make voting registering to vote as easy as possible for young people, well, we're going to meet them where they're at. We're going to meet them at concerts. We're going to meet them at festivals. We're going to meet them at community events. And we're going to show them firsthand, like literally hand them the piece of paper and say, this might seem intimidating, or I don't know what you've heard about voter registration, but it's so much easier than you could ever imagine. You're going to fill this out in less than a minute. Your friends are going to wait for you. Like they're not going to go anywhere. And then you're going to go see the best concert of your life and you'll be registered to vote and ready to roll in November. And that is a really empowering experience for people because if you register to vote at the DMV, you maybe forget about it. You're like, oh, I think I registered there. But if you're at the Harry Styles show that you saved up all year for, and someone comes up to you with a clipboard and says, hey, are you registered to vote? 
you're going to be so excited. You're going to remember that forever. And you're going to take that experience with you to the polls. And so that yeah, is so, kind of uh, just, so do you think then that it's just simply the personal touch, actually having someone in front of you um, saying, here's the opportunity. Is that, is that really the, the barrier for so many young people? They just don't have the personal connection. And well, and also you're mentioning that it's in a, it's in a relaxed and fun venue where they're going to a show, they're anticipating having a good, good time. But I imagine that just having a person in front of them, a young person engaging them, talking to them and saying, hey, it's no problem, it takes just a minute. And then to Nick's point, you're, you're empowering them as well. Like this is Absolutely. your chance now, participate. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think about it, that experience can have a ripple effect because if one person registers to vote and has a really positive experience, then they can empower their communities and they can talk to their friends about voting. And that's not only true for the act of registering, but also the act of voting. Um, you know, the best way to engage with our communities is by one on one saying, hey, do you need a ride to the polls? Like, I'm going to vote on Saturday during early voting or hey, have y'all looked at the ballot initiative that's going to be on our ballot yet? You know, it's kind of confusing. Let's talk about it. And that personal engagement really kind of creates a sense of accountability within your communities, but also a sense of empowerment. And so, um, yeah, that's that's kind of one way that we have found is a really effective way, not only to reach Gen Z voters, but all voters who maybe are skeptical or maybe who have been out of the voting process for a while. And so that's kind of one answer to, to the initial question, but then also thinking about accessibility and ensuring that voting is a process that is accessible for all folks, regardless of abilities. Um, you know, one of the things that we have seen in some of the bills that have been passed in recent years are pieces of bills that make things like voting by mail more difficult and a unintended or intended consequences, who's to say, is that it's harder for folks with disabilities to vote. So the most um, most kind of pressing example of this is what happened in Wisconsin. Um, so there was a bill that was passed in Wisconsin, and it essentially made it impossible for people who had um, severe disabilities and could, didn't have use of the, um, their arms to vote because you could no longer have someone assist you in the voting process. So if you were someone who was a quadriplegic and for years your family member or your your friend helped you vote, all of a sudden that was technically illegal. And it went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court and was ultimately ruled that it would not, like that is not legal to, to have in a law. And so that part of the bill was struck down, but kind of empowering people to say like, you know, if bills are passed that are illegal, like legislation or taking it to the courts will show that it is illegal. But in bills that are legal, but make it tougher for people to vote, I think the best thing that we can do is kind of over-educate and help people over-prepare. So one thing that we always like to say, and many voting organizations like to say, is that election day is the last day to vote. It's not, it's not the day to vote. It's just your last opportunity to vote. And that kind of allows you to shift your mentality and say, okay, it's a month from election day, what do I need to do to get my ballot now so that I have plenty of time to return it? Because I know I might be out of town or I know that voting in person might be difficult for me because of my abilities. Um, and so- So it's so simply introducing the idea of trying to handle this in advance uh, is the way to try to counter some of those challenges that folks who have um, you know, impairments or, or special needs um, can sort of you know, not have to think about it on the day of, essentially. Absolutely. And and I mean, that that is true for people who have disabilities, but it's also true for people who are busy. You know, like Donna was saying, when you're a mom and it's election day and your polls are open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., it's going to be tough to find a 30, 45 minute window for you to go and vote in that period. And so, yeah, introducing the idea that you have options, but also the idea that you have rights. And so, if you are someone who has an impairment or who has disabilities, like when you go and vote to the poll at the polls, you are legally like allowed to have people help you read the ballot if you need assistance in reading the ballot, or you are legally within your right to stay in line if the line is still long at seven o'clock. Like helping people know their rights 
also is a is a form of empowerment that we find is really helpful. So Nick, I just blabbered for a long time. So yeah, Nick, Nick I wanted to, to throw this your way a bit because I feel like um, using communities uh, to help others. I mean, in in some ways, like um, you know, as we know in other in other countries, um, election day is like a national holiday. Um, and in, in the sense of, you know, with, when, it, when it is a national holiday, you're recognizing the importance of it, but also you're creating a celebratory kind of atmosphere where, you know, maybe people don't have to go to work or they don't have to go to school or their, their usual routine is interrupted uh, to honor this tradition of voting. So I'm wondering, like, what's your experience working with communities that try to support um, this type of thing that Tom was talking about, meaning uh, those who can't vote easily, those who are busy, those who have challenges. Uh, I mean, what kind of things that you're, are you seeing within communities to help support others? Sure. Um, I, I, one of the benefits of doing this work is being able to see some of these incredible people who step up to create the framework by which people can vote when there are challenges to it. You know, I do want to underscore like what both Donna and Tom said. Uh, part of this is really just making a plan, right? It's making a plan so that you know when you're going to vote, whether it's early, by mail, in person, day of, having that plan all set. Um, and another thing that we do at vote.org is making sure that voters know what laws affect them state by state, right? So that they're ready when they show up um, or they're ready when they actually send in their vote um, by mail. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we've seen is there are a lot of organizations that step up for people who may have visual impairments, for example. We um, we have a partnership with an organization called Be My Eyes, um, which specifically you know creates uh, a buddy that's going to be able to go with you on election day and help figure it out. It helps pair people up that way. Um, we also have a, a partnership with Lyft, um, who is going to be providing a certain amount of free rides to the polls for people who may have disabilities or who live in rural areas that are super far away from their polling location. Um, so we're in constant conversation with people, right, and, and other organizations and figuring out how we can overlay our work together to make sure that people are getting the, the help that they need. I think another um, another key thing, and, and you know, we're all talking about how difficult it is actually on election day, um, is making sure that businesses are stepping up too, because businesses right now with election day not being a national holiday have the power to give their employees the day off, give their employees paid time off, um, and make sure that they're able to go and exercise their right to vote. Um, we have a program called electionday.org um, that specifically pushes for that as well. Uh, and, you know, it has to be something that a lot of businesses take on themselves at, at the moment as we don't have Election Day as a federal holiday. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's both businesses that are have salaried employees and businesses that have hourly employees where we really see the need even more because if you're working a shift and it is an hourly shift, you're not going to be able to get off in the same way that you are. Um, with a salaried position, especially one that has more flexibility, like working from home, as a lot of positions do now. Um, so there, there are several things that I think people are starting to step up and provide that extra support um, while we, I think, as a society are hopefully marching toward, uh, you know, Election Day being a federal holiday and trying to uh, extend early voting hours, extend the dates by which you can send in a mail-in ballot so that uh, there are not these these huge hurdles that people uh, with disabilities or people who just don't have the time so that they don't have to hop those every single time. I think another part of this um, is encouraging uh, people to do more than just voting, uh, you know, or more than just casting a vote, I should say. Um, it's, it's encouraging people to go a little bit outside of their comfort zone to do things like uh, canvassing, uh, door knocking, um, participating in voter registration drives, um, you know, you know, D Donna, maybe you can speak to this. Have you seen um, ways that are effective of communicating with people, you know, who maybe you know want to volunteer? Um, the volunteer uh, component among uh, moms is always amazing to me, given how busy moms are. There's so much volunteering going on uh, with uh, with moms, maybe because they're used to being in charge uh, of the household, or they're or they're dealing with kids and work, and they just why why not take on one more thing? Uh, what kind of what kind of um, uh, uh, volunteering are you seeing 
um, and what kinds of messages can be most effective encouraging in encouraging people to actually do more than just thinking about their own vote, but trying to get others to vote as well. Well, thank you for that plug, because we are right now this week, we are in the process of um, sending out postcards to 830 30 million, um, no, 830,000 voters, and we need people to handwrite notes on them. So I'm going to put in the chat the link to sign up. You can sign up to do 200 or uh, 100 or 20, and um, they're free, they're pre-addressed, they're pre-stamped, uh, so all you have to do is write a note on them when you get them, and you don't have to be a mom to help out. Um, that You can be, you know, a young person to say, you know, I'm 24 years old, and, you know, I hope that you're going to vote for me and, and my generation's future, so I'll put that in the chat, but we Moms are expert at nudging, basically. Like we know <laughs> and nudge people. That's what we, we do as in our roles in the world. And so um, at Moms Rising, we have a multi-layered approach to getting out the vote where we use handwritten postcards. We do direct mail. We do mom-to-mom uh, -mom texting. We do phone calls. Um, we do digital ads all around, you know, this concept of, Together, we make the future. Like I know one-on-one, -on -one it feels impossible, but when we're doing this together, we can change the future. And the future, you know, is what we do together. The future is the sum of us acting together. And that's really the messaging that we are pushing because it is a time where, you know, because of COVID, people have felt so isolated and it's been so disempowering for communities in so many ways. And to really lift up that sense of, you know, we're in this together and together we make change is I think the message that's really empowering now. But I will drop that sign up in the, in the chat. I hope everyone will sign up. Great. Yeah, thank you. That's a great suggestion, uh, Tom. What are you What are you seeing on this front? Uh, how do you, How do young people get other young people um, to participate? Um, not just by thinking about their own vote, but thinking about how they can um, affect others. Uh, are you Are you seeing that there's that kind of engagement? Yeah, I think that one of the things that's really exciting from kind of a headcount perspective is because we view things through the nonpartisan lens, we kind of are an introductory point. And so maybe someone comes and volunteers with headcount and has an amazing experience and uses that to learn more about candidates that they want to support. Or maybe someone interacts with a headcount table at a show and is interested in what we're doing, but maybe wants to be a little bit more political than registering people to vote in a nonpartisan sense. And so you know, we can kind of provide that launching point for people to investigate what candidates or issues they care more about. But one thing that is really exciting is this is kind of the first cycle where there are Gen Z candidates who are running for Congress and for many other positions across the country. And specifically in, in regards to young people, that is a incredible way to mobilize them. And because everyone wants to have people who are representing them that look like them and that have so that speak like them and 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 have similar mannerisms and so that is one thing that I've just kind of been noticing like as someone who follows politics both for my job but also just like for fun is when there's candidates who are younger the support of volunteers from all over the country who are interested in supporting that candidate and phone banking for that candidate or that issue that in, impacts them is so robust and so exciting because these are people who are in college and maybe have part-time jobs and are juggling a bunch of things. And they choose to, on a Thursday night, do two hours of phone banking. And that's awesome. And so, yeah, yeah. There, I think there's definitely an engagement and an excitement, which again, just kind of flips that narrative and makes it more complex of people always saying, oh, young people don't care. They don't participate, whatnot. Like, no, they're they're tapped in and they're excited. It's just a matter of, having the right cause or the right candidate 
that gets them excited that maybe is that missing link sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I, I, for sure. I mean, that's the kind of thing how, that, to me, that's how young people first really get excited about politics is when they see somebody that they really want to get elected, somebody that speaks to them, somebody who might be their age or have some similar perspectives, or is just saying things that they believe as well. I'm interested, Nick, in, in finding out like, what kind of, how does vote.org address the volunteerism part of that? Um, do you have specific programs? Do you have thoughts of, of how you encourage people to get involved? Yeah, so, you know, we are also uh, like headcount a nonpartisan organization. So it's a little, it's there's a little bit of tricky stuff going on there. But what I will say is one of the programs we absolutely endorse is that people should sign up to be poll workers. Um, across the entire country, you're going to need poll workers. Um, it's a really great gig. Uh, you learn a lot about democracy uh, firsthand. You learn intimately the rules that affect your actual um, elections on a local level, and you figure out how those are administered. Um, and it's just a really great way to sort of get involved in, in that process and feel like you're making a difference on the actual day. Um, I will say from a more partisan lens, so we have partnerships with a bunch of organizations um, across the political spectrum. Um, you know, I will... I'll say Planned Parenthood is one of them, just given the, the with the, of course, just crush of voters registering after the Roe uh, v. Wade overturning decision from the Supreme Court. Um, we we partner with a lot of organizations that, uh, that deal with specific issue areas. And um, we wanna make sure that we're providing voter registration, verification and, tool, and ballot tools to um, organizations that are actually working in some of this more partisan work so that people who are engaged on a certain issue um, can then take that next step and turn that into an actual registration and turning out to vote. Um, so I, I think there's there's no shortage of organizations that people can you know get involved with that really speak to a specific issue area that they may care about. Um, but you know, of course, the thing that we are the most concerned with is that you turn that that interest into action and that you actually register to vote, make your plan and get out there and vote on those issues. Uh, and you know, it's it's a really great way, I think, for you to figure out what's going on in your community too. A lot of these organizations have local chapters um, that you can get involved with on a local level and figure out what that means for, for your community and, and the laws that may be coming up there uh, you know, on yeah, the ballot. For sure. I mean, that local part of it is really where uh, that first step, that action is taken. You did mention something that I think uh, kind of has, has cast a bit of a dark cloud over the upcoming election, and that is um, the intimidation that we've seen, uh, the threats and the fears that are going on, um, both uh, directed at poll workers themselves um, and efforts that may be uh, in the in the planning stages for um, the poll the the polling places, the, the places where people are actually going to vote. Um, so that that is causing a lot of concern, and rightly so. Um, so I'm just interested in what kind of um, things that you've heard about uh, uh, strategies for coping with this, of uh, supporting poll workers. There is, a, there is in some places, there's a great need for poll workers uh, because there's a shortage. Um, so I'm interested in hearing from all of you guys on that. Donna, what are you, what are you hearing on this? Well, I mean, there certainly is a lot of um, intimidation going on. Having said that, there's a there is a lot of attempts to try to suppress the vote by spreading fear and uh, doubt about the elections. So I think, um, you know, we have to acknowledge that and yet continue to lift up, um, you know, that the vote will happen. You know that there are systems mm -hmm. in place that people there has to be sort of a, a we try to have some messages of voting can be fun, you know, to counter the massive amount of negative messaging that's out there, which is intended to suppress the vote. Which, exactly. You know, exactly. so there's like a balance. And I mean, Nick, you, you're working on this issue much more closely than we are. I'd be interested, particularly in your thoughts. But um, there yeah. is a danger of like this, this the threatening messaging getting so amped up that people are afraid just to go to their polls. Yeah, exactly. Nick, are you doing that? Are you are you stressing the positive when it comes to encouraging people to, to volunteer as poll workers? 
Yes, absolutely. Right. I think that the part of the entire message around voting is that we we are the change that 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 we have want to see in the world. Right. Like you have to go and exercise your right to vote in order for this system to work. Um, and I think that people understand that on a person to person level. Um, you know, unfortunately, this isn't the first time that people have faced voter suppression or voter intimidation efforts. Right. I mean, for decades and for <laughs> since the dawn of uh, the franchise for Black voters, there has been concentrated efforts to intimidate and prevent Black voters from actually making their voices heard at the ballot box. Um, and yet, uh, Black voters turn out at above average rates um, compared to their white counterparts. There is constantly going to be a threat to um, to people's ability to vote, but the, the way to continue pushing back against that is exercising your power and trusting that uh, this process will continue the way that it has for decades at this point. Um, and understand that this is this is no normal time, right? This is a a really wild political time, especially when it comes to sort of the trust that people have in institutions and the electoral process, um, but the forces who are trying to prevent you from voting count on you being intimidated, count on you not turning out. Um, and I think that that is one of the most powerful arguments to empower people to turn out to vote, is that why would they be putting in all this effort if your vote didn't matter? Exactly. Um, so exactly. Plan, you know, if you don't feel comfortable doing it in person, making a plan, going with friends, doing it early, doing it by mail, figuring out a way to um, work around this issue. And, uh, you know, if you feel safe and comfortable to be a poll worker, that's a vital sort, that's a vital service and something that I think a lot of people, um, would really enjoy doing and should for think sure, about. for sure. I mean, I think the experience that if you talk to people who've done it, it's, it's great, you know, it's, I mean, yeah, there might be some problems here and there, but I think for the most part, people are, are pretty, pretty stoked about doing that. Um, and it is fun. I mean, you get to meet a lot of people, you're out, you feel like you're really part of the process. So I'm sure that's all part of um, what you're conveying to people as well. One thing that I think that might be per perhaps a, 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 um, an underrated part of what's coming up uh, with the midterms, as is commonly the case when you have an election like this, um, there's there are other issues in play besides the candidates that people are voting for. There are a ton of these statewide ballot measures. I think 137 is what I counted. 137 is what I saw. So are those uh, are those things that you guys, as organizational members of groups that are really focusing on getting out? Do you focus on that? Do you bring those things up? Are you aware of some of those ballot measures? Do people ask about them? Um, maybe Tom, you can you can talk a little bit about this. Yeah, absolutely. So ballot initiatives are amazing because when people feel disenfranchised from kind of the political conversation, oftentimes it's because of fatigue from kind of the discourse around Congress and the White House and national politics. And ballot initiatives are kind of a way to engage those people through a different avenue. And so maybe they're fed up with how their congressperson is doing or, or whatever the issue, whatever the case might be, right? But if they care about cannabis legalization, if they care about healthcare issues, if they care about taxes or the right to bear arms, like these are all things that are on the ballot this year in different states. And so it's really a way to re-engage that person who maybe is not interested, but also to show others who are planning on voting just how important their vote is. And so, you know, kind of always asking people what issues matter to you. And then oftentimes there might be something on the ballot that directly relates to the issues that people are passionate about. Um, just to kind of like highlight some of these things. So cannabis is going to be on the ballot in five states this year. Abortion is going to be on the ballot in five states this year, six if you include Kansas, who already voted on it in August. Um, one state that has a lot of really interesting and like really hot topics on their ballot is Nevada. So Nevada is voting to um, whether or not they would increase the minimum wage in the state. They're voting whether to include gender identity as being something that's protected in the Constitution. 
and they are also voting on whether or not ranked choice voting could be used in future elections. And so wow. any, one of, any one of those would be a fascinating story. All three together, like it's going to be really interesting to see how Nevada voters turn out if this increases voter turnout. You know, sure. like that that type of stuff is really interesting. It's it's exciting. And as we've kind of talked about, you know, local politics and state politics are where we see the most impact in a voter's day-to-day -day life. And maybe nowhere more apparent is that than ballot initiatives because yeah. As soon as the results come out, that is written into law. And, it's done exactly, yeah. and, and and so and it's also it's pretty easy to find out what those ballot initiatives are. I mean, all you have to do is type in the state that you live in and upcoming ballot initiatives, and there's ample resources in each state to sort of go through exactly what is going to be on the ballot. So that's that's easy. I think there's also, I mean, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, I would just bef before this event, I was looking at some of them and, you know, there's, um, there is, uh, there's something called the National Association of Secretaries of State, which um, has a website uh, and a program called Election Protection Initiative, which basically talks about how people can, how people can become poll workers. Um, and there are local things like in New York City, there's the Bar Association is um, helping uh, students and members of the bar um, how, how to guide them into becoming um, uh, activate, a active in terms of helping ensure, you know, these free and fair elections that we're all uh, after. So there's a literally, literally, there's almost no end of resources out there um, for people um, to, to, and of course, the organizations that you three are part of, um, you guys all have robust websites, you all have programs, you all have information. Um, but I think at this point, it's really, it, it's incumbent on the individual, each person to do something to find a way to help. Um, and so I thank all of you for, um, for being here and, and expressing um, what, what's going on and, and giving some really great suggestions. I did want to leave a little bit of time uh, in case there are some, uh, some questions. And there is one right now, anyone who's participating, if you want to um, uh, ask a question, you can go ahead over to the Q&A part. Um, of, of this event and you can type in and, and there is a question, how do you support creative local leaders um, who have ideas that can inspire people to vote, especially marginalized communities? I think we addressed that a little bit, but perhaps we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, we're talking about like sort of inspiring local leaders um, to, uh, to, to inspire others. Uh, I don't know, who wants to take that one? I can start and then pass it along. I'll, I'll just get the ball rolling. Um, but I think that the idea of inspiring local leaders and inspiring community members to enact change and promote democracy in their homes is by just kind of like elevating what they're doing because one of the things, so Headcount is a national organization where we have teams all across the country. And one thing that I always tell our, our local team leaders is, hey, I can help you set up an event, but you're the one who knows your community. You're the one who knows where people are going to be. You're the one who knows which communities might need voter registration resources. Like, I live in the suburbs of Chicago. I don't know what the team in Sacramento is going to need, right? And so really just helping people to recognize their autonomy and recognize the power that their voice has and then they can use that to empower their whole community, right? And so it's kind of a organizations like all of ours using the tools and resources that we have to say like, here's what we can help you out with. If you need anything else, like let us know, but you're gonna crush this and you're gonna have such a positive impact. Like that positivity piece is really important. Um, you know, maybe you don't always register a hundred people to vote at an event that you're doing, but a hundred people did see your table that was set up and they had a conversation with the person that they were walking next to. And they were like, hey, are you registered to vote? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. And that's a positive change. Mm -hmm. Or maybe someone doesn't need to register, but they have a question about how to access their ballot, right? And so metrics are not always the best way to gauge success in terms of like community events and organizing. Um, it's more so about the, the impact that you have with the conversations and the interactions that you have with people. And so- yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I imagine a lot, a lot of positive interactions and conversations are going on uh, within um, 
the communities that you support over over at Moms Moms Rising, Donna. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that that's a big part of what you do? Yeah, I mean, we're in constant conversation with our members and uh, moms across the country. And I was just thinking of one example of um, a great idea that bubbled up from a member was, it was about mm, six or seven years ago, we had a member who said, you know, I can get my kid to go to the dentist by telling them that they can get a toy from the treasure box when they're done. Why can't we like make it fun for kids at the polls by having treasure boxes at the polls. So we started this in North Carolina and we had treasure boxes of toys and activities for kids at select polling places in North Carolina. And it uh, went so great. And we like the next election cycle, we spread it to other states and we did micro-targeted digital treasure maps to certain um, low frequency mom voters to give them a map to the poll and like that was all from one mom's like idea about how to get her kid to the dentist so yeah there's awesome ideas out there everywhere yeah, that's, that's amazing that's that's a great story I, I love hearing about that i mean i think it, it reflects to a certain degree that you know some of the restrictive measures that have been passed that are making it more difficult uh, for people to vote means that on election day, you're going to get these longer lines, you're going to get people who are going to have to wait uh, for periods of time to be able to get in and to vote. And it feels like making that experience a positive experience rather than a negative experience by having activities, by having ways where people can support people who have to stand for a few hours or whatever it is in line, um, you know, just, just being creative and fun uh, to make the experience a positive one um, could go a long way to, um, you know, convincing that person that, hey, you know what? Yeah, I did have to wait a long line in a long line, but it was still fun and I enjoyed it. So, you know, next year I'm definitely going to do this or whenever the next election is. Um, you're nodding your head, Nick. It sounds like you've you've uh, had experiences like this yourself. Yes. Yeah. And it, you know, just reminded me as well. Uh, you know, I think that there are one, a lot of things that local elected officials are doing to make this a little bit easier, right? Like in 2020, we saw um, 24 hour polling locations in Texas, um, which was a really great creative idea that some local elected officials had to increase turnout. Um, so there's definitely cool things that are going on to increase turnout and make it a little bit less of an issue uh, for people to uh, make it harder, I guess, for people to vote. There, there are some creative solutions to that. But yeah, in the meantime, too, you know, we we sent food trucks to a bunch of um, long voter lines last year or in uh, 2020 to just like give people some meals while they were waiting in extremely long lines. And on the side of the food truck, we had like voter protection hotline numbers in case people were getting turned away after waiting in line for three hours. So um, I think Donna's idea is it's such a great one too, because there are there are things that people are trying to do to make this easier um, in the long run, but in the short run, there's so much we can do to step up, um, you know, making this a more enjoyable experience. So uh, it's cool that that's happening on just so many different levels. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So we have a question, uh, and I'm, I'm frankly, I'm not quite um, familiar with this issue, but, uh, the question is, what are your thoughts on election consolidation? Um, and uh, I guess, I guess it's in California. There's a th this person who's asking this question is asking about um, uh, California mandates elections be consolidated uh, if an off election cycle election has let greater than 25 percent different. Uh, Hmm. Greater than 25% difference in voter turnout from the national election. I, I admit to not being familiar with this. Do you guys know about this issue? Election consolidation? Are you, are you familiar with this? Only slightly. Um, I, I feel like California is often a testing ground for sort of these new ideas when it comes to uh, like how elections are administered. Um, I mean, it, I think that the, the the goal of that, right, is so that people don't have to keep coming back and doing different elections like every few months uh, versus your, you know, your local versus your state versus your federal. Um, so if there is an opportunity for people to be able to vote on more issues that matter in one sitting, um, that seems like a positive. It also can be something that you have to do a lot of extra research on. So I, I understand that there are two sides to that coin, but 
Um, I think that it creates more of a climate in which people can go and make their voice heard issues and do their civic duty and not feel like they have to come back the very next week. That seems like a positive in terms of people's being, people being able to plan out how they're going to vote over the Yeah, like voter fatigue or something. Are, are you familiar with this, Tom? Have you heard about this? So I'm I'm not. Um, and, you know, again, being nonpartisan, we we don't take any stances on any issues or, or candidates or bills of, or anything mm -hmm. of that nature. But, um, you know, we do support things and movements that will promote voter turnout increasing. And mm -hmm. it seems like this bill could potentially be that. I, I mm -hmm. am not really sure, but I imagine right. that's probably part of the reasoning as well is, you know, if, as as Nick was saying, if there's not three elections in a calendar year and maybe there's only one, that would hopefully promote voter turnout. But Got also, it. we don't know. Okay. There's another question here. Uh, how can you volunteer to uh, to work in a phone bank or participate in places where you don't live uh, if you want to help uh, races in other states? Um, what kind of what kinds of options are there um, for that? Um, do you guys have uh, some thoughts on that? Nick, Nick, you seem to be nodding your head. Do you have some ideas there? Yeah, sorry, I'm a serial head nodder, but um, <laughs> yeah, okay. I, uh, I, am, I am too. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, this is something you can do uh, by if you have a specific candidate, for example, that you that you have a vested interest in, um, you can go to their website, sign up for their email updates. I encourage folks if you have a candidate to sign up for their text message updates, um, because text message updates are going to give you the best insight into the type of work that they need from volunteers. Um, you can phone bank now from just about anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there are apps that you can get on your phone that they will guide you through, uh, that uh, campaigns will guide you through. They'll give you a list of numbers. You can call through those numbers and help them phone bank. Um, and, uh, you know, there are also, of course, uh, the types of initiatives like Donna was talking about with postcard writing that you can do from almost anywhere as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I would encourage folks to either find a candidate or an issue advocacy group that you care about. Um, and sign up for their email and text message updates. And that's going to give you a really good insight into how to plug in in a, in a more concentrated way. Excellent. I'm glad you mentioned that because one area that we didn't really uh, talk about is ways that you can support uh, a candidate that you're in favor of, somebody that you'd like to see elected. You're going to vote for them for sure. You're going to tell your friends that you're voting for that person. But what else can you do? And it sounds like what you're recommending is engaging with the candidate's website, signing up to get text messages from them, um, and maybe even that leads to some kind of volunteer work or phone banking or what have you. Yeah? All right, great. Well, we are at the end of the hour and I thank you all heartily for participating. This was a great session. You guys came and brought it with some really terrific ideas and thoughts and experiences. So I very much appreciate you participating in this.